Thank you. So welcome to Alston. Welcome to the Harvard Ed Portal. And one of the things that we really believe in is giving sort of the community of Boston and also indeed Cambridge an opportunity to come together in this space and share ideas and actually listen to members of the Harvard community that really have important things that they, that they would like to share. So one of the aspects of Harvard X is that one of our primary goals is really reach, trying to make meaningful, impactful educational content more broadly available for the world. But Alston, and actually any local area around Harvard, is very much part of the world as well. And what we've realized is that online education does not replace sort of in-person learning. It's an opportunity to actually bring the two together. So here at the Ed Portal, what we believe is that at the same time that Don Goldsman's course is running on the Harvard X platform, it's an opportunity for a group of us to get together with him and share ideas and really gain an insight into Dr. Goldman's mind that I think in some ways transforms our experience of what he has made available for us online. So Don Goldman is both a distinguished researcher and professor at the Harvard Medical School, at the Harvard Chan School for Public Health, and also he is the chief uh, a medical and scientific officer at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I could spend about 10 minutes telling you all of the fantastic things about Don's background, but I think really importantly is that he is a remarkable educator. At the same time, he is a remarkable researcher whose work has spanned basic science to almost every aspect of translational biology that you can think of. So his perspective on healthcare and healthcare improvement is truly insightful and remarkable, but on top of all of that, he is someone that cares deeply about education. He is well known as a remarkable mentor at both the medical school and the School of Public Health. And as if doing all of that in the context of Longwood, of our Longwood campus, was not enough, Don also comes to Cambridge and teaches a remarkably powerful and very popular general education course in the Science of Living Systems segment of Harvard's Gen Ed program. So with all of that being said, it is also worth noting that Don has a particular love of pasta and growing vegetables. <laughs> so he is a real person on top of all of that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Goldman. I'm also a bit of a sloppy person here. It's not very nice to have this lying around where Rob could trip on it. Now, uh, can you all hear me okay? What do I need to do to, this says on. Now you can hear me, no? I can use a handheld mic if necessary. If it doesn't. No little light, though. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Or I can speak in my usual stentorian voice. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Well, we can just do that. That's no problem. If I run out of voice, they'll bring up a, uh, a microphone. So uh, there was a little technical thing here. Normally, I can look at my computer and see the slides, uh, but that's not working. So uh, I'm going to just try being stentorian. Um, oh, it's being recorded. OK. All right, so now you hear me with a microphone. I have to pipe down a bit. So I'm going to try not to look back too much and to uh, try and remember to change my slides here and my slides there. Uh, what, what we're going to do, first of all, thank you for coming. There are many more people here than I thought would be interested in uh, this topic, so I really appreciate it. And I just warn you that uh, I'm going to start with a little background, and then there'll be some uh, stuff that's uh, frankly a little bit pedantic and, and intellectual. Uh, but then I'll get to some stuff that I hope will be a little bit more uh, fun for you. 
So you're probably familiar, you may be familiar with this uh, very important work uh, called To Air is Human, uh, which uh, all the way back in 1999 pointed out that if you go into a hospital, your chances of being harmed in some way are not negligible. Uh, all kinds of potential problems. You might get a, uh, uh, an intravenous infection. You might get a urinary tract infection. You might get pneumonia. You might get a wound infection. You might get a pressure ulcer. You might have delirium. And I could go on and on. And all these things take a toll and actually have a effect even after you leave the hospital. People tend never to be quite the same after they've had multiple harms in the hospital. So that was in 1999. Uh, then, uh, just a couple of years later, there was another report that said not only are we harming people, but we're not giving them the care that the evidence, the scientific evidence, shows uh, is, um, see, I'm not going to be able to do both. I can see that. That's not going to work. We'll just forget that. I'll just stand here. This is called, as you'll see, this is called a plan, do, study, act cycle. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so this report came out and it basically said that you have about a 50% chance of getting the care that is evidence-based, uh, let's say if you have blood pressure problem or if you have heart disease or if you have diabetes. So things have improved a little bit on both of these counts, but uh, not nearly as much as we'd like to see. The Institute of Medicine in the report on quality of care said that these are the parameters, these are the objectives that we're trying to improve in American Healthcare. We want care that's effective and based on evidence, that's safe, in other words, devoid of harm that could be uh, prevented, uh, timely, uh, when you want and need it, uh, efficient without waste for uh, the healthcare delivery system, but also for you. I mean, I don't know if any of you have had to deal with waits to see a specialist or uh, if you've had some sort of malignancy, God forbid waiting for all of the tests to be done and waiting for the referral, waiting for the decision. All that's waste from your point of view. Uh, it should be patient-centered. And you'll notice I've said respecting preferences, culture, and circumstances in which people actually live. This is not just a catchphrase. It's not something I put on a slide. Uh, the equity in uh, health and health care in the United States absolutely depends on us respecting, understanding, uh, and listening to uh, those kinds of issues that patients and families bring. Uh, and it's got to be uh, equitable. We have terrible disparities in this country. I do a lot of traveling. It's an embarrassment when I travel abroad, uh, even sometimes to un undeveloped economies, and people look back here, especially in certain regions of the country, and see the disparities we have in things like premature delivery, uh, maternal mortality. In fact, in some cases, there are um, counties or even parts of whole states in this country that have results that are not much different from the poorest parts of Africa. So a lot of uh, um, attention to equity as you'll see in this talk. Uh, I always made a, I, I made a, a, a commitment to myself that I'd give no talk in which I didn't use this slide. And MLK said the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. And I'm sick and tired of seeing presentation after presentation, talking about bending the cost curve of health care in, in, in this country, listening to candidates for office talk about the cost of health care. Yes, we have the most expensive health care system in the world by about double. And yes, we have quality of care that's uh, lower than many, many other developed countries. But until I see somebody put up a slide that shows bending of the equity curve, I'm not going to be happy with bending uh, the cost curve. Uh, this is a new framework that I find useful in thinking about the healthcare uh, delivery system. And you'll notice it starts with two concepts. Equity, which as I said is uh, really critical, and, and value. Value simply means the quality of care delivered for the cost that you're uh, uh, putting, uh, the, the money you're spending. It's a ratio really of quality divided by cost. And that should be a driver. If we're going to reduce costs, we also should be keeping quality the same or preferably uh, increasing it. Here are the uh, Institute of Medicine aims that you see there. And on the bottom are care coordination and the uh, health system in which we work. And you also have to pay attention, as this slide shows, to prevention, to acute treatment, and to chronic uh, disease management. At least uh, when I get to be this age, uh, the chances are very good that I have multiple morbidities. I'm 
fortunate to have only one morbidity, but I can't tell you because we have confidentiality laws in this country, but I just have one, but most people my age have two, three, or even uh, four. Now, I'm going to talk about quality improvement and what quality improvement can do to improve the healthcare system and also your own personal lives, even your family lives. Maybe if you have kids, the way you relate to your kids. And I, and I will spend a lot of time on that, but I don't want to do what so many people in quality improvement do. They talk as if this is the answer and medicine is all disaster and harm and not being effective and not giving the care. I just want to remind people of the great advances that we've had in medicine. I've just put a few up here. The elimination of a growing list of vaccine preventable diseases. We're about to eliminate polio from the world. We're very close uh, to doing that, for example. Uh, we've uh, uh, eliminated smallpox and we're about to eliminate guinea worm, which is a, a parasitic disease that uh, disables millions and millions of people in Africa. So these are great advances. I never thought I'd see the day where HIV became a chronic disease and not a death sentence. And there are millions of people worldwide living with HIV AIDS who now have a chronic disease. That, that's not a great situation, but it's a lot better than the day when people were told, you have HIV, you're going to be dead. I absolutely never thought I would see hepatitis C which is a disease affecting hundreds of millions of people in the world and that leads inevitably <coughs> in some to liver cancer. I never thought I'd see the disease cured, cured within 12 weeks. It's just absolutely amazing. That said, the therapy does cost about $100,000, which is uh, uh, almost insupportable uh, as a way to treat the millions of people who need it in the world. Uh, dramatic approval, uh, improvement in survival of heart attack and stroke uh, if you, I'm not going to show you a lot of data, but basically the uh, trend in mortality from a heart attack looks like that. It's gone down inexorably and dramatically over the past uh, two decades. And most importantly from my point of view, because that one's not working. No, that's better. Oh, that's much better. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Less echoey. Uh, so when I was in training way back when, Babies who were born under 1,000 grams very often died, and babies born at 800 grams always died. And now these babies routinely survive. And this was not due to quality improvement. It wasn't due to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. It was due to dramatic improvements in technology and therapeutics and very dedicated intensive care staff who now know how to save these babies with uh, these wonderful uh, advances. And uh, another area where uh, I'm Tr totally changing my way of approaching patients is around cancer. So a lot of what IHI do has done is to say, well, when you have cancer, if it's, uh, uh, you're going to have to have chemotherapy and the prognosis is it may extend your life by two months, maybe you ought to think about the quality of your life and maybe you shouldn't take that treatment. Now I have a friend who had colon cancer and he was supposed to not survive for very long. And everybody was weighing whether he ought to take the chemotherapy or not, because the chemotherapy, as you know, is toxic. And this was a guy who didn't really believe very much in modern medicine. He believed in alternative medicine and he delayed, sort of like Steve Jobs, he didn't believe that he actually could be treated by modern medicine. But he agreed to go on a protocol. And the protocol extended his life by a number of months. And by the time he began to decline and relapse, there was another protocol. And then there was another protocol. And now we have drugs that are uh, attached to uh, nanoparticles uh, that can target a specific cell in cancer and hone right in on it and deliver, uh, it's either an antibody or a, uh, a toxic uh, compound right to the cells that need it and not to the rest of the body. And so he's now on his fourth protocol and has just come back from a tour of the fjords. Now I'm not saying that everybody's gonna have that miraculous, we have not cured cancer, there is no one cure for cancer. Each cancer is different. The cancers in different people act differently. But I don't think we can say anymore that uh, what we would say 10 years ago, which is don't wait for the next protocol because it's too toxic and it won't help you. So these are revolutionary. I spent more time on that than I should, but I I'm sort of tired of people who are quality improvement gurus talking as if the rest of medicine isn't making dramatic advances uh, that have amazing benefit for patients. Now, 
I'm going to talk about the so-called science of improvement. And Rob Liu is here, and I remember the first conversation with you, Rob, you, we were talking about this, and you said, well, it seems a little bit narrow. And that's because I was talking about the science of improvement the way we discuss it at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and that's what we call it, and our methodology is called the model for improvement. And it's a great method. But I just want to remind everybody here that I'm not going to talk about the other sciences that are part of improving quality of care. Epidemiology, ethnography, some, the social sciences. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of ways to skin this cat, and uh, I just don't have time to talk about them all tonight. So I'm going to focus on this practical science uh, of improvement. Now, you know what it is in academia. If uh, I'm an improvement scientist, and I'm getting promoted, and I'm publishing in a journal, there's a younger colleague, or maybe a colleague who looks at me with uh, some envy and says, I want to be where he is, but he's already filling that niche. He's the guy. I'm going to name it something different. I'm going to call it implementation science or healthcare delivery science, and I'm going to publish some papers using that word, and then I'll make my own journal, wh which I will be the editor, and I'll found my own society, of which I will be the president, and then I can be a professor because I've developed a new field uh, and published in this field. All of these names you'll see come from the same roots uh, in industry, actually in American industry, from people like Deming, Schuart, and others. Uh, I'm not going to give you that whole history, but just trust me on this. The root of all of these names is very, very similar uh, in a scientific sense. So here's the model for improvement simplified. Now, for some reason, Edwards Deming, who's the great uh, sort of founder of this whole science, decided to call it profound knowledge. And he therefore cursed people such as myself and all of those who've tried to come uh, after him with this horrible name that puts off uh, every physician I've ever talked to and probably sounds arrogant to you as well. So it is called profound knowledge, but let me make this really simple because it really is pretty simple. There are four elements to profound knowledge. The first is how do we know? It's learning. It's the technical word is epistemology. What is our theory of knowledge? And we'll talk a lot about how we learn in real time uh, when we're trying to improve uh, uh, systems. And you'll notice I said systems. That's the second element. We all operate in systems. When you get up in the morning, you have a system for making your coffee or tea, for making your cereal, for getting your berries and doing what I do, which is put in the microwave for exactly 42 seconds. If they're frozen and they come out perfectly, you then get a bowl and you take the bowl and you put it, and, and, and if you get sloppy, the cat comes and eats your cereal, like happened to me this morning. But we all operate in systems. If you can't <coughs> articulate the system in which you are operating, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, or an astronaut, you can't possibly make it reliable, and predictable, and you can't improve it. So systems is the second. The third is understanding variation. Now let's say I undertake a project to improve the visibility of Ed Portal uh, in Austin Brighton, and I want to grow the audience. Rob said reach. I want to grow the audience to 6,000, okay? Uh, now uh, that's terrific, but I better have some statistically sound method to tell when I make a change, am I really improving things? because there's normal variation. In this room, the temperature will not change much because there's a thermostat. And it's just going to go like this. You may feel a little cool, a little warm, but it's going to readjust. And it's just basically random variation uh, over time. When you do improvement, you want to be statistically sure that you're either getting better or you're getting worse. So that's variation over time. In improvement, data is always shown over time. It's not a bar graph before, after. So is that clear? That's variation over time. Then, you know, Harvard has competition, right? Uh, so uh, if Stanford is doing better with its uh, edX platform, uh, or Coursera is doing better with its platform, uh, presumably the people who run Harvard X will look and say, well, there's variation there in the outcomes and the reach and what people learn and how many complete the MOOC. And they'll want to learn from that variation. So variation over time, that's statistically important, and variation amongst doctors, nurses, universities, hospitals, and whatever. And, and that I tend to call that heterogeneity. And this all boils down to the model for improvement that was uh, developed uh, back in the 90s. And it's totally simple. 
you ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? What is my specific aim? And that means how much, for whom, by when. And you would be amazed how many projects I see as I go around from hospital to hospital uh, and health system to health system where it's not a measurable aim for whom by when. So what's the aim of Boston Children's Hospital, where I work? Till every child is well. Okay, I'll just ask you, what does well mean? I'm not going to really ask you, but what does well mean? What is every child? A, a measurable aim, how much by when for whom might be, I want to improve the uh, uh, or reduce the absenteeism of children with asthma in uh, Roxbury uh, by 25% within a year. Now I know what I can do. I can begin to get ideas that I can test to, to change uh, that uh, important outcome. So that, is that clear? Okay. Then uh, how will I know the changes in improvement? What is my measurement framework? If I think, for example, that I'm going to improve uh, asthma by having school nurses uh, give the uh, inhaled steroids that kids take for their asthma, uh, that's something I ought to be able to measure. Uh, so you have to have a measurement framework to make sure that what you think you're doing is actually happening. And then what changes can I make? What ideas do I have? And here's the critical thing. There are lots of good ideas in the world. Our political candidates have lots of good ideas. Even the one I voted for has lots of good ideas. <laughs> But I'll tell you that he or she, <laughs> not going to get me on that one, he, he or she uh, does, uh, does not really have a plan for testing those ideas within our healthcare system in a way that I understand what that prediction actually is. These ideas all have to have a prediction behind them. What do I predict will happen? How will I test it? And how will I measure to see if my prediction actually worked? If you don't have a theory, you don't have a prediction, uh, then I'm not that interested in your idea because it, it, it's, it, I'm going to spend a lot of time and money uh, trying it out. And then there's these rapid tests, and we'll get to explaining what PDSA is, but it's basically I'm going to plan an experiment, uh, I'm going to uh, implement it, I'm going to study what happens, and I'm either going to throw away the idea or I'm going to improve it based on the findings. It's basically the experimental method. I, I'm going to skip that. I'm talking too much about... Uh, all this stuff. So uh, this is really simple stuff. I remember when I was talking to Rob and trying to convince him this was a science, I talked about my uh, life as a translational uh, scientist working with uh, a, a PhD at the Channing Laboratory at, at Harvard. And we were trying to develop a staphylococcal vaccine. You know about staph infections, right? MRSA, MRSA, all that stuff. He, he had a theory, a prediction, that if he extracted a compound called PNAG from the cell wall of a Staphylococcus bacteria and injected it into animals, uh, actually mice or rats, that an antibody would develop to that substance. And that antibody would uh, attach itself to bacteria, the Staph bacteria, and that would allow white blood cells to come and eat them. It's called opsonophagocytic antibody. Now that's a prediction, right? So how do we go about testing that? Well, first we had to purify the stuff, and I'll skip that part. But we had a series of experiments we ran along what we thought was the causal pathway from getting this antigen to getting protective antibody in patients. The first thing we had to do was decide how to inject it into a mouse. Well, do you do it subcutaneously, intramuscularly, intravenously? How much do you use? Uh, how long should the infusion be? How many doses do you give? Each of those is a PDSA cycle, and we ran them in rapid succession. We knew within a week whether or not uh, our particular mode of injection or the dose was going to work. Uh, and, and this is just PDSA cycles. We had a theory, we had a measurement framework about measuring the antibody, and after about a year of these experiments, we actually knew that we could get uh, these protective opsonophagocytic antibodies in rodents. Well, now how do we know that protects against infection? Another prediction. We can produce an infection by injecting a gajillion staph uh, in the skin of a mouse. Well, it turned out mice, because they run around in filth all the time, and rats even worse, don't get infections. You need 10 gajillion bacteria. And we had to do a series of PDSA cycles uh, to demonstrate that. So that's the idea, right? It's just the experimental uh, method. Uh, the Ebola vaccine, which is being developed now, 
uh, and has been tested in, in uh, Africa, was developed the same way. There was a theory uh, that if you took certain aspects, certain parts of the Ebola virus uh, that wouldn't cause infection but would stimulate antibody and inject it in various ways that the patient would get antibody against Ebola so when they were exposed they wouldn't get uh, ill. Uh, the same thing in trying to develop an HIV vaccine, but it's very tricky because the HIV virus changes very, very rapidly. It mutates and it's very hard uh, to get a vaccine that really works. But that's the, that's the idea. Any questions about that? What's the, what does PDS say mean? Plan, do, study, act. So I plan, I do it, I study it, and then I act on the results to Sorry, modify. Sorry, that's okay. So here's a personal journey. Um, the first thing to remember is that all this PDSAing and all this kind of stuff uh, in the system that you have may be just tinkering. It, it just may not be enough. And sometimes we fail to step back and say, my system for getting up in the morning and making cereal with berries and coffee really stinks because it, it takes too darn long for the coffee to perk and I'm always late and, and I've got to have a new system. My new system, by the way, is to use a timer on my coffee thing, which is a sacrifice. There's something I call a balancing measure. What is the unintended consequence of doing that? I grind the coffee the night before, and that wonderful aroma of the coffee grinding I don't get. So there's always trade-offs. But here's an example. Uh, so my son, uh, and please don't tell him I'm telling this story. Promise me, swear. My son's name is Ari, and when I came home uh, when he was a small kid, uh, we had a bluestone crushed uh, walkway. Uh, and so when I walked to the back door, you could hear me crunch, 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 crunch. And I could look in the window and see Ari watching the telly, the television, right? I've been in England for a couple of months, all right? And I would get furious. He's watching the telly. And I'd come in and I'd say, so, watching the telly, son? And I would do this over and over. And it got to the point that when he heard the crunching of my feet, he would be angry before I even got to the door. <laughs> so there was actually a book written by a psychiatrist on quality improvement. He calls this a nightmare without end. It is a system that's doomed to get exactly the results that it's been getting because you're not really fundamentally changing it. So I could do little PDSA cycles. I could try walking on my heels on the car stone. I could try crawling. I, I, you know, I, but that would never, never wash. He's too clever for that. So I decided I'm going to come in the front door, not the back door, go upstairs, change, wash up, come down and say, so Ari, how was your day? And his television watching measured by number of times uh, he was watching TV when I came in the house plummeted. So that's changing the entire system. Uh, how to grow cucumbers. So, uh, you know, I was introduced that I like to grow vegetables. So. We're now going to uh, show a short video, it's about three or four minutes, that will show you what a PDSA really is. So I'm going to talk about, of all things, cucumbers. I care about vegetables. I even have raised beds. I spent a lot of time and effort on my raised beds and my vegetables. I don't want stuff to go wrong. So this year I decided I was going to plant cucumbers. Prepared the soil, put in the fertilizer, dropped in the seeds, three seeds to a hill by the way. They sprouted and then things started growing like crazy. I ran around my bed and I'm looking at my cucumbers with tremendous admiration. So then I come back from work one day and come home and I see that my cucumber vine's been chopped off by a weed whacker. Turns out every Monday there's this guy that comes and he does our lawn and he has a weed whacker and he chopped off my cucumber. And this results in a pretty stunted cucumber vine. So I said, hey look, I've got this theory that if I prop this cucumber vine up on the raised bed more carefully, the weed whacker won't get to it. That's my prediction. So I put the cucumber vine up on the raised bed, I come back, and by golly, the head was chopped off again. My prediction was not correct. So I studied the result. This wasn't a very deep study, uh, but it was clear that this was a disaster for my poor <coughs> cucumber. So I had to revise my plan based on what I'd learned. I had to act in a different way. My next experiment was to put a large flower pot in front of the cucumber vine 
hoping that the guy with the weed whacker would understand he wasn't supposed to meddle with this thing. And lo and behold, I come back, come home from work, and another PDSA cycle has failed. He mangled my cucumber again. So at this point, I thought about doing something that you probably use in your life, and we certainly sometimes default to in healthcare, and that's called brute force. I want to find the guy, the weed whacker guy, and basically grab him by the shoulders and shake him and say, you're killing my cucumber. But I restrain myself. This is improvement. We don't want to blame people. We want to do things better, make things better for the weed whacker guy as well as for myself and my cucumber. So my next PDSA cycle was to put the cucumber up on a trellis. I figured if I had a trellis, and I have a very pretty one, as you can see, it's, it's in the shape of a leaf, it's really quite attractive. Uh, I prop the cucumber up on that trellis, and then the weed whacker really won't be able to reach it. And lo and behold, look at it, it thrived. My prediction was get the cucumber vine out of the way so the weed whacker absolutely can't get to it. This is called a forcing function. The forcing function is darn weed whacker just won't get that high. It just can't do it. My cucumbers are thriving and I'm telling you I had the best marinated cucumbers. A little bit of onion, a little salt and vinegar, a little dill, just like my mom used to make it. This was a really good PDSA and it illustrated all the principles that we've been trying to tell you about this simple test. So that's it, that's, uh, that really is a series of PDSA cycles, always a prediction, always a theory, always looking at the results and adjusting uh, your approach. Now, the, the other personal project, uh, you know, on the MOOC, most people have decided to do a personal uh, project about uh, their exercise or their weight, or it, it seems like we're obsessed with this uh, in the United States, and so am I, right? So uh, I decided, uh, on, and I committed this on the, on the MOOC, uh, that I would spend 20 minutes on an elliptical at the gym, which I absolutely hate, <laughs> absolutely hate, uh, at level 10, there are levels, uh, at least uh, twice a week. Now, actually, this is a lie. Uh, on the MOOC, I said I would do it for 25 minutes at level 12 when I went back and checked. Uh, but uh, my balancing measure turned out that I wanted to also do weights so I'd be toned and fit. And, oh, I forgot I have a mic. Uh, and and uh, uh, I didn't have enough time to do those exercises, so I decided on the uh, level, uh, level 10 for 20 minutes. So, uh, what happened? Well, let's uh, first, of, uh, first of all be clear about my prediction and the cause and effect here. This is part of a plan for me to lose a little bit weight of weight and to get fit. I'm actually, right now, 4.5 pounds over the weight at which my wife said she would divorce me. This was many years ago. I think she's, um, having done a lot of PDSAs in our life, she's decided it's not worth divorcing me over 4.5 pounds. But I do want to lose weight. So, this is called a driver diagram. It's basically a cause and effect diagram we use all the time in quality improvement. And I urge you to make one. I, I tell all of my fellows I mentor, make a driver diagram about your life. If you're gonna be at Institute for Healthcare Improvement for a year, make a driver diagram about what you want the outcome to be when you leave and how you're gonna get there. It's as simple uh, as that. And they're primary drivers, the most important levers that will drive the result you want uh, there are secondary drivers and then there's some change ideas. So well, let me illustrate what I mean. Uh, that's the uh, aim I want for the new me. Now I'm not going to disrobe here uh, at uh, Ed Portal. I don't think that would be appropriate, but I don't think I'm quite there yet. But as far as I know, the only drivers are calories in and calories out. Those are the primary drivers. And just for the sake of argument, I put some things here that are uh, secondary drivers, what you have to do to get calories out and what you have to do to get calories in. So here I was ambitious. I thought I'd work out five days a week. Well, that turns out to be two. And then I do walking to my errands. And I do a lot of walking. I never, ever uh, get on a, uh, the, the tea unless I absolutely have to. And then there's some other things about what I take in. Now, you'll notice the alcohol. Avoid alcohol. So uh, who, who drinks wine? Okay, the, the young lady there in the blue with the blonde hair. How, how many calories are there in a glass of wine? Well, close. That's uh, between 150 and 200. So, uh, look, I have a stressful job. And when I get home at night, I've gotten in the habit, because I really like wine, of having a glass or at the most two. But that's, what, 300, 400 calories. And that affects my calories in. 
But I can also tell you, if I go home and I've had a really stressful day and I fall into the trap of having my one or two glasses of wine before I'm supposed to go to the gym, that will affect my calories out because I'll never make it to the gym. <laughs> so a driver diagram is just that simple. And, I, and really, if you're going to have some improvement project, like all the students are doing on the MOOC, and a lot of them posted their driver diagrams. Oh, I have to tell you, I'll never get through this talk, but I have to tell you a story. The best comment, somebody said their goal, their measurable goal, was to reduce the number of times Sebastian the cat barfed overnight. <laughs> because when she gets up in the morning, she has to get her kids out and all this kind of stuff. And if she has to clean up the barf, so all of her PDSAs were around ways to not have the cat barf. And, but uh, having a driver diagram to actually show what your theory is, what your cause and effect is actually pretty uh, helpful. Now, all of these things are measurable. That's key. Remember I said you have to have a measurement framework. So you look at the slide, and I'm not going to go into detail, but you have to have some measure of weight, BMI, or actual weight, and then you have to be able to uh, count your calories or the number of glasses of wine or whatever it is. So that's the measurement framework. Now, here's my uh, actual uh, time-ordered run chart, as we call it, or our, my data plotted over time uh, for my number of visits uh, uh, to the gym and my, uh, and my uh, time uh, at, uh, uh, on the elliptical. And you can see here, this is time in minutes, and I gradually worked up. To, it doesn't take long to get up to the, to the uh, uh, time I wanted. Uh, of, uh, at that time, remember, it was 25 minutes, but there was 20 minutes, 20 minutes, but then I traveled and I fell right off the graph, so I had to remember if I'm going to travel, I should plan for it and get my workout in before I go. So I'm traveling on Monday, Sunday night, I'm coming back from Vermont, I will go to the gym. Uh, and, I, and I actually uh, did get up to, uh, over 25 minutes for a while, but that didn't last, and I'm not showing you that data because it's embarrassing. <laughs> so. I said that you ought to be able to describe the systems in which you work. So now I'm going to talk about my work life, not my personal life. This was the first system diagram I did in my career. I had just been appointed as medical director of quality improvement at Boston Children's Hospital. And the uh, uh, head of uh, pediatrics came to me and said, you have to do something. There's a terrible problem with admissions from the emergency department. A trustee's daughter came in and she waited 12 hours from the time they decided to admit her until the time they actually put her in a bed. And it's terrible. And people were arguing. The nurses were fighting with nurses. The interns with uh, interns. The, certainly the nurses and the doctors were fighting with each other. So I had to get a diagram of what the system was to admit a patient from the emergency department to the floor. And this is when a decision had already been made by a doctor to admit the patient. Look at that thing. You don't have to know anything about what the diamonds and the squares and the arrows are. It's just a mess. And, and I, I had to do a second page with footnotes. So this is a really, really bad system. But it shows the power of actually diagramming your system. When I showed this to people, and it was constructed by housekeepers and nurses and doctors and administrators, all of whom knew some little piece of this, look at, look at, at that mess. So this is really, a, I'm not going to go through the whole improvement project, but that was my first lesson, that an interprofessional diagram drawn like this can be very helpful. So here are five simple examples of interprofessional quality improvement that I've done with trainees, you know, junior doctors uh, in my time at Boston Children's. And I think, I'm not going to tell you about all of them, but they're, they're illustrative. Now I should tell you that when I started, I was the service chief or firm chief on the adolescent medicine ward. And there was a nurse named Sally, and I had to call her Sarah Pasternak at that time. And I came on all full of optimism and was going to collaborate. And I'd already demonstrated in infection control how nurses and doctors can work together. I was so excited. I went to my first meeting, and she humiliated me publicly. She had this stereotype that doctors and nurses are like oil and water, and doctors are basically not the best people to work with. And so I was really hurt. I mean, I'm, I'm serious, seriously hurt. First day, and she humiliates me publicly. So I had a choice to make, and I don't know when, uh, whether the Lord spoke to me or what. I said, I am not going to let this stand. And I went to her office, made an appointment. I walked in, and I said, Sally, or Sarah, sorry, Sarah, uh, I just want you to know how it felt to be in that meeting. You really hurt me. I was really wounded. I really was looking forward to working with you, and I still am. But we have to get over this because I'm in pain. It's almost exactly my words. 
I was younger then. The pain was real. And she said, I had no idea, she said. I had no idea that I had said something to offend you. I had no idea what your goal was. And from that, literally from that moment, the relationship blossomed. And now, even after all these years, we still occasionally keep in touch. And we did all of our work together, all these projects uh, collaboratively. So the first one was, this is a ward full of patients with cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, chronically ill uh, adolescents. Uh, and we just went around and asked 10 of them. People say, oh, we don't have a database. We can't get all the data. We don't have electronic medical records. Full. You just pick a simple, convenient sample, and you go around and you say, do you know your doctor? And I didn't even want to know their name. I just want to know, do you know, you, do you know you, your doctor? Do you, do you know who your doctor is? And nine out of 10 said no. This is a chronic disease ward. It's Boston Children's Hospital. One out of 10. So I don't have to do 500 or 10,000 sample to get a p-value, that's pretty clear. So we did a series of PDSA cycles where basically we scripted uh, what the intern would say when he went into the room or she went in the room, what the attending physician would say when he or she went in the room, what the nurse would say so that they got this, the patient got the same message from multiple people about what an intern is, what an attending physician is, and who is their primary a decision maker, and within just about a month, it was up to 90% of people knew their, their doctor. So very simple experiment. Um, understanding drug usage, you know, we're always trying to reduce unnecessary use of, uh, of drugs and, and waste and the cost of all that. So I simply had the pharmacy give me what's called a Pareto chart, fancy QI word for a, a bar graph that shows the frequency with which each drug was being administered on the ward, and another graph that showed the cost of the drugs being administered. And right away, a resident looked at it and he said, look, we gave three patients ribavirin for respiratory syncytial virus, and it cost almost a million dollars. And I've done a literature review, and there's no evidence ribavirin is effective. So within one day, the first time we looked at this, we eliminated ribavirin from the ward and saved almost a million dollars. And that was a, a wonderful uh, kind of catalyzing experience for that, that guy. Learning how to look for uh, medical errors is part of uh, routine work. My infectious disease fellow, the trainee, didn't believe that Children's Hospital makes mistakes. We always underestimate the frequency of mistakes. So uh, I said, well, on rounds, why don't we just make a list of all of the errors we see? And we went around and we made this list. It was a very long list. It, and some of them were quite serious. A child with osteomyelitis about to go home, bone infection, about to go home on the wrong dose. And it was so powerful that we wrote a paper that was published in a leading peer review journal. So not only can you do this with trainees as part of real work and demonstrate all the quality improvement tools, you can actually publish it. You can get promoted. I mean, the, the main reason I'm a professor today is not that I'm that smart. Uh, not that I work harder than anybody else, but because I was able to translate most of my quality improvement work with an, into uh, uh, rigorous experiments, if you will, that were publishable. And they were all interprofessional. There's not a single one of those papers where I'm the first author. It's always a nurse, a medical technologist, a pharmacist, and it makes a big difference when you work in those kinds of teams. Now, people say, well, you know, we're working under hardship. We have to cut $20 million from the partner's health care budget. You know, Mass General can't afford to do quality improvement work, or these are difficult times. Well, probably the most uh, rewarding project I've ever done was in Bogota, Colombia, during the Medellin cartel drug crisis. I, w I arrived there, first of all, if those of you think that Colombia and Bogota is a wonderful paradise with tropical palms, in the winter it's absolutely freezing and it rains every day. Uh, and the roof of my hostel that I was living in leaked because I had almost no money to do this. But I went with a fellow and an obstetrician, and we did just-in-time training for their big problem, which was cesarean delivery infections and endometritis. And, and here I am in an armored car. The, the um, host brother had been kidnapped. It, the worst possible, a, a safety net hospital caring for the poor people in the barrios around Bogota could not be more deprived, more stressed, worst environment, middle of winter. So what happened? We did just-in-time training of simple QI tools. So I could call this an Ishigawa diagram. It's from the east. It's Toyota. And you know, immediately you'd say, ah. Oh. Or I could even call it a fishbone diagram because it looks like a fishbone. It's simply a cause and effect diagram. We asked the 
people who are doing the work, what do you think causes these infections? And they listed all this stuff, and it ended up being in five main buckets. What the mother brought with her to the delivery room, uh, events around the birth, the surgical technique, uh, the preparation of the skin, and the giving of antibiotics. And if you look at the detail there, which I'm not going to go over, this is a pretty good list of all the things that could cause infections in cesarean delivery. They did a great job. They're smart people. They do the work. Uh, I'm an outsider. They know what they're doing. So uh, they wanted to know, what about these antibiotics? Uh, what's the evidence for that? So you have to have in your pocket the evidence. This is, after all, science. And so I had brought with me this graph. Now, I'm not going to go into it in too great detail. I'll just tell you that uh, anything under one means that this is relatively protective to get the antibiotics. In other words, if it's 1.0, there's no effect. If it's anything under one and these little bars, statistical bars, don't cross one, that's statistically significant. And there are five, not just studies, but five what we call meta-analyses or conglomeration of studies looked at in a rigorous mathematical way. Five different meta-analyses, all of them showing a profound effect on antibiotics. And even though the tendency when I go around the world and talk about this, they'll say, well, you didn't do this in uh, Bangladesh, so we don't believe it. Th this is so compelling that they thought this was a generalizable thing. So uh, they had to then decide, what are we going to work on among those five buckets of possible causes? And they did something you should do in your life. Has anybody ever done a priority matrix? Wow. Oh, wait, yeah, but your ringers. <laughs> we, didn't, okay, we can't count, but that's good. Good for you. A simple way to make decisions in your life. Now, this happens to be the priority matrix we used in uh, Bogota. But you'll see what, and I see that the type didn't line up very well. But uh, the, what, what is the impact? What do I predict the actual effect on infection will be? And, and so you can score from one to four, four being highest. Is this within my span of control to improve? In other words, can I actually make a difference here? Do I have any uh, control over this uh, process? How easy it is to implement? What's the cost uh, with, uh, with one being the highest cost in this case and four being the lowest? And what's the time frame in which I can do it? I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a scoring sheet. And here you can see the five buckets of causal factors that I went over a minute ago, including antibiotics. So if you look at this, they thought it would be great to work on antenatal factors, that these uh, mothers were coming in with no maternal care, lots of risk, and surely if we could help them, things would work out better. The problem is, uh, even though they thought it was important, it wasn't in their span of control. They don't run the, uh, the, uh, the barrio. They don't run the clinics even in the neighborhood. It would be hard to implement it. It would uh, be costly to go out and do all this work, and it would take forever. However, antibiotics, giving those antibiotics High impact, relatively low cost, easy to implement, could do it very quickly. So we had to find out what are they doing with antibiotics. And again, uh, th I, they did not complain. We don't have a database. We don't have a nurse to collect the data. We don't have a statistician. We simply took a heap of charts that were lying around and said, did they get antibiotics and did they get them at the time they're supposed to get them? Really, really simple. And you can see in the first hospital, 70% uh, uh, got the antibiotics, but they weren't on time. The other hospital, uh, mediocre uh, getting it on time, terrible getting them at all. So what did we do? What did, who's going to tell me what the next thing we did was remembering that system is one of the key aspects of profound knowledge. What, what, what did we ask them to do next? Yes? Everybody gets the antibiotics ahead of time, and that they get them in an hour after they deliver. That's great. I might have planted you in the audience because that's jumping the, jumping the solutions before you have described the system. So the first thing I had them do over cold Colombian coffee and, and stale bread uh, in the morning was to draw a system diagram. And you get some surprises when you draw a system diagram. Here's the system in Hospital A. You plan to perform a cesarean delivery. You prescribe prophylaxis or you don't. The diamond means a decision. So already you're learning how to do a system diagram. If the answer is yes, I want the antibiotic, the doctor then writes a prescription. It goes to the pharmacy. However, the pharmacy may or may not have the antibiotic because Eli Lilly had donated some antibiotic to the hospital and now wants them to pay for it, and they can't afford to have that drug in their pharmacy. Every obstetrician thinks they have a special antibiotic they want. So 
uh, it's a relatively poor hospital. They may or may not have that drug. If they don't have it, the doctor writes another prescription on a different pad, gives it to the family that goes out into the courtyard where what look like food trucks are waiting, except these are drug trucks, and they have to buy the antibiotic and rush it back to labor and delivery in the hope that the mother uh, hasn't been delivered yet. So that's not a very good system. And then they redesigned the system and it did exactly what you said. Now the doctor writes a prescription. The default is you get a drug. Uh, the only reason not to get a drug is if you write down why. And no doctor is going to take the time to write down why. So everybody got a drug. The only decision was, is it a cheap generic drug called uh, clindamycin, or is it a cheap generic drug called cefazolin? That's the only drug you can give. If you're a penicillin allergic, you get the clindamycin. It's put in the packet to go to the operating room with a mother, goes there, and is, and, and, and is given. Now, uh, of course, I told you you have to monitor the effect over time. And this is a very sophisticated interrupted time series analysis that I'm not going to explain, but it is time-ordered data measuring three things. Did antibiotics get given, the open circles? And you see it took very little time to get them to be given because we had the standard order form. Did they get delivered on time? Well, that took longer because of issues in the OR and people forgetting and so forth. Those are the open squares. And the black diamonds are the infection rate. And the infection rate fell highly significantly over the duration of this uh, effort. Uh, and this got published uh, by the uh, fellow in the Archives of Internal Medicine. So another example of training in real time, simple methods, no fancy jargon, doing something that they really cared about, not requiring statisticians or databases except for that analysis, uh, which we did back in Boston. But it would have been just as good to do it on a piece of paper, to tell you the truth. So why is understanding systems so important? And I, I think I'm going to close with, with this because I've used more than my time. This is not a trivial thing. The safety of, in your, of your daily life depends on monitoring and knowing systems. Uh, and we hear every day of some food that poisoned people, raspberries or lettuce or chocolate milk or whatever it is. And all of these result from some form of system failure. This is a particularly dramatic one because it was a Swan ice cream company. Anybody from the Midwest? Do you ever have Schwann ice cream? It's an institution, right? They've got these yellow trucks. That happens to be available on eBay. There's a whole thing about these little yellow trucks that you can get for many years of Schwann. And, and all was good. There's their beautiful logo. In 1994, there were 224,000 cases of salmonella in the United States due to contamination of Schwann ice cream with salmonella. Now that's an extrapolation by the CDC, but it's based on real data and it's almost certainly uh, pretty precise. 224,000 cases. You would want to know what the system failure was that led to that. You'd want to know what the system was. So I'll describe the system. I don't have any, I, 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 that's, uh, yeah, there's the headline in the New York Times uh, in case you wonder how much attention this got, talking about how to doom a, a business. Now, we're having the same thing now with, uh, what's the name of that ice cream company in uh, 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 Blue, Blue, Blue Bell uh, ice cream. It's the same kind of thing. Their system was you get the eggs, you crack the eggs, and you make a thing, uh, a slurry of eggs. <coughs> you put it in a tanker truck, and you take it to uh, a factory where the eggs are turned into ice cream. Okay? So they're in a tanker truck, they go to the factory, they have a thing for making the the uh, ice cream. Now you've got the ice cream base all made and it goes into a tanker truck and goes somewhere else where the automated filling of the containers and the flavorings are introduced. So what do you think happened? The system is get a bunch of chickens, get their eggs, crack the eggs, make an egg thing, put it in a, in a tanker truck, send it to the factory, make the ice cream base, put it in a tanker truck, take it to the other factory where flavors are added and it's put in little cardboard containers and put in yellow trucks. Yes? The eggs temperature during transport wasn't Yeah, actually it was, uh, it, it was okay. Uh, it was okay. Yeah, it wasn't. That's a good thought though. Absolutely. Temperature control. I don't have the slides here, but uh, I did a Wendy's outbreak uh, where uh, the temperature was uh, monitored except when you're making chili. This was an outbreak caused by chili. If you'd stick a thermometer in without stirring the chili, you get an unrepresentative temperature. So it's, but it's a very good thought. Any other ideas? Absolutely. 
they use the same tanker truck to transport the pasteurized egg base, ice cream base, back to put the flavorings in, and so it was contaminating the course of transport, which is an incredible idiotic thing to do, right? But people forget the importance of monitoring and controlling every, uh, every component of the system, 224,000 cases. I could stay here until 10 o'clock at night, but won't. Uh, telling you story after story that, as my wife says, do not, do not go out to eat with Don. By the time you're done, <laughs> you will not drink, you will not eat, and maybe you won't breathe. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it there. There are a few more slides, and you're welcome to have them. But uh, I just want to make it clear that this is important uh, work, not only for the healthcare system, for your avoiding harm when you go into a hospital, for getting the care you want and need for the conditions that you may develop, for the prevention of diseases you've yet to acquire, for the vaccines that are being made, and for your own personal life, whether you're trying to grow cucumbers, trying to look like Charles Atlas, or trying to lose a few pounds. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to stay here all night if anybody wants to come and well, wants to ask questions. Do have time for some questions for Don? And we're going to have a microphone hostage so that we can um, capture Ask me anything, you know, especially challenge. Because at IHI, frankly, sometimes uh, uh, we, uh, we get a little bit pom-pom and cheerleader, cheerleaders about this. And I, I want to ask me something tough. Why don't we start there? since I persecuted you on, the, on your answer. No, that's okay, that's great. Thank you, this was an excellent presentation. One of the challenges that um, have, um, has really posed problems for me is once you identify when you've got a system that, that basically delivers what it's designed to deliver, this is a poorly designed system, you're gonna get poor outcomes and vice versa. So the question is, and it's a change theory question because you've got so many moving parts that are involved in a system. How do you motivate people to get out of their comfort zone as this is the way we've always done it and it's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. So how do you get that bigger yeah, so, buy-in. So there, there are um, several components to this. First of all, I forgot to point out the fourth component of profound knowledge, which is psychology and beha behavioral science. And improvers in general are not great behavioral scientists. I, I know of almost no examples where behavioral economics, for example, are used uh, as part of change. So uh, the, the first answer is you use behavioral scientific approaches to getting people to change. That won't happen. Uh, if you have a culture in which people are worried or afraid or intimidated about speaking up and pointing out problems in the system. We sometimes call this a culture of safety. But what happens if I'm at Boston Children's Hospital, for example, and I raise a question uh, about the, uh, the chief of cardiology's practice and his system of care? And I'll tell you, I, I say that knowing that uh, there was a cardiologist there uh, who had a patient, a cardiac surgeon, who had a patient with staph infection who I put on isolation precautions, and he didn't like that, so he unplugged the patient from life support, wheeled the patient to a different part of the hospital to take care of him where he didn't have to listen to me. So behavior change can be really, really tough, especially in medicine where there, there's a lot of, a lot of arrogance. But it does require mo role modeling by leadership um, uh, in the hospital, that transparency is a very important thing, that it will be rewarded, that if you're gonna fail, fail frequently and fail well, learn from your failures, we'll celebrate that. If you report errors, we'll celebrate that. So the behavioral psychology plus a culture of transparency and safety is really the answer. The, there was another hidden part of the question, which is we work in complex dynamic systems. It's not simple linear stuff like my driver diagram for losing weight. The way you deal with that is to really understand the system and do a prioritization based hopefully on data of where you're gonna attack the system, knowing that improving that one area may not move the whole big dot end result, but if you're convinced based on evidence or, or your strong belief that that change has a linkage to the outcome and that as you peck away at all these as aspects of the system, you will change the outcome, 
that, that usually is fine. We call this segmenting the problem, starting with uh, the places where you can make a quick difference. Does that help? Yes, thank it's, you. It's a, actually a complicated uh, question. Where, wherever you think, you're the mic guy. You, you'll, be, you'll be more democratic than I am. Uh, so you just said that you didn't think that behavioral economics was used very much in quality improvement, but it seems like um, a lot of those sort of small tests are exactly like what you sort of think of with behavioral economics, like small nudges and stuff to get um, big changes in behavior. So could you explain a little bit more? Yeah, so I, I, this is where being ignorant is a real problem. So I thought, because I'm ignorant about these things, that behavioral economics involves somehow money or rewards or, or taking away things. The, the theory that if you remove uh, something from that somebody's used to having, that's more powerful than giving them a little something. So I thought it had something to do with economics, because it says behavioral economics. Well, it turns out I invited somebody over who heard me talk at the Harvard Business School in their health club. And he said he's interested in behavioral economics. He came over and he taught me that exactly what you said. It doesn't have to be money. It's a behavioral change way of approaching things. So you're exactly right. Under the broad category of behavioral economics, we use it all the time. But we could use economics. So in Mexico, for example, the con what we call conditional cash transfers. If you give very small amounts of money to people to do, let's say, preventive therapy or take a vaccine or uh, see their doctor for their impending birth, uh, you can get a lot of change based on very small uh, amounts of cash. And and that's being investigated. It works in some contexts, doesn't work so well in others. Um, there, there are other methods you can use too. Another Mexican uh, example, you probably know that in Hispanic culture, uh, the idea that a woman would uh, use contraception to prevent the man from demonstrating virility by having many children is not an easy sell in a family. So uh, the Mexican government decided they would uh, promote soap operas in which it was a macho thing to do to actually encourage your wife to use birth control, which was controversial given the church and everything else. But in a soap opera format, it was just part of the drama of everyday life and it had a pretty good effect. So it's a good question. Um, I just had a question in regards to kind of the influx of telemedicine and direct care, how you see that impacting the systems that are currently in place in like an inpatient model, for instance? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because one another, uh, please don't tell my boss, I have a new, a new boss. <laughs> I don't want him to know that I ever say anything that isn't absolutely positive about my organization. But in, ad in addition to the behavioral science thing, one of the other areas where we have not uh, leveraged what's possible is in telehealth or M health, mobile health. You know, I, th this is transformative. Uh, the MOOC aside, uh, using tele, tele methods or smartphones is going to change everything. The, 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 we used to measure uh, economic development in Africa by miles of telephone lines. Now we do it by density of smartphones. And, uh, you know, smartphones are ubiquitous in Africa, and actually they're ubiquitous in the poorest neighborhoods of Detroit. So we're going to have to change the way we think about how we reach patients, interact with patients, uh, how we use uh, telehealth in the hospital. Uh, it, it's just radical. And to do improvement work without thinking about that is really, uh, we're, we're, not, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose the uh, influence uh, battle if we don't do that. So just two examples. This seems like it's all new, but it was about 14 years ago I went to visit, um, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the name, Baton Rouge, uh, LSU. And uh, they were using telemedicine uh, with people living on homes on stilts in the bayou uh, who had diabetes and they had to do foot ulcer checks. And it was all tele-images uh, tele being sent to LSU where people could look at it and give advice. I was doing a study in Russia on surgical site infections where somebody was sending me images of the wounds so I could classify whether they were really infections or, or not. So, uh, and, and the most remarkable finding, there's a guy named uh, Brian Jack at BU. Uh, you know, discharging patients from the hospital is complicated, especially if they got a lot of medicines. Uh, and he wanted to test whether a computerized avatar uh, would work. And so he had a avatar, this computerized nurse, 
uh, and uh, with a skin color to match the patient and uh, health literacy appropriate, give discharge instructions. And then they did a survey to see whether the patients liked this or not. It turned out they trusted, they trusted the computerized avatar more than their doctor or their nurse. They liked the computer, you know, there was a range of responses. When I show this to physicians, they go ballistic. But in, in fact, it, it, stuff works because we don't take the time and we don't always have the skill that you can build into the computer. NASA astronauts, I didn't realize, there's a guy at the Brigham who's working with NASA to develop cognitive behavioral therapy uh, virtual experience for astronauts who almost always get depressed. And it works really, really well. And, and now it's widely used uh, in England, for example, uh, when you have mild uh, issues that could be addressed by cognitive behavioral therapy. So very, very important question. I'm really interested, any, anybody in the audience who's uh, interested in using smartphone technology uh, to deal with social determinants of health uh, and equity in communities in the Boston area, I would love to talk to you because I think we're totally not leveraging that technology. Wow, this is great, the questions. I didn't know. I was worried nobody would have a question. Uh, I have one about, I've been dealing with my mother who has diabetes and who has mild memory issues. And every time we've, and we've been through it a lot, right? <laughs> we've had to go from the hospital or the whatever, the care unit to like the uh, skilled nursing facility. Her diabetes, the insulin regimen just goes out the window. I, I, you know you do that plan study. So every time we did this, I'd go again and I'd grab the nurses, I'd get them to tell me, have them write it down. I would take it to the, you know, make sure it got to the right place at whatever, the ne you know, where she was staying to recuperate. And we still couldn't get it. So I found just working, I just trying to find the right person to ask and I would get shunted around and then it was like, because I wasn't the patient, but she couldn't be an advocate for herself. So it's like, it's the system where everyone's trying to be helpful, but it doesn't work. Yeah, so. I, I, you know, I had the exact same experience with my mother-in-law where my wife and I visited and she was not really totally with the, with the picture. And uh, even though she in her slightly cognitively impaired state said, he's my son-in-law, you should listen to him, he's a doctor, nobody would tell me a thing unless I got some signed document from God. So it's a real problem, but worse than, worse than that uh, is we don't trust patients and families to do what they do every day in their house. Uh, Don Berwick, who's uh, you know, a great man and founded uh, IHI, tells the story of his father who went in, he had Parkinson's disease, he went into a, a hospital and they somehow didn't adjust his medicines right. That the family could have taken care of his Parkinson's medicine. He got rigid and he got rigid and he got a pressure ulcer and he got stiff and then he couldn't get out of bed and he was never really the same. So this idea, and, and in my ward of children that I was talking about, I tried to get the cystic fibrosis patients to self-administer all their routine drugs, which they do every day of their life and they have a system to do it and know they had to be given by a, a nurse. So you point out something really important. And by the way, considering telemedicine, I don't know why in nursing homes there isn't a, it could be optional, camera through which using your smartphone when you're gone to Turkey to uh, see the Blue Mosque, you can't see your loved one and communicate uh, in real time. That, to me, that's an obvious solution to involve the family. It's probably too much fear, too many regulations. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Sorry, guys. I, I'll, I'll stay a few minutes after. Thank you. I think that um, to, to tie to actually these questions and the prior questions you have brought out about uh, the doctor being surprised that the patient would prefer an avatar uh, is the fact that in the systems uh, you, you have the goal, but you presume all the quote unquote the components of the system like your coffee making machines would contribute to the goals almost selfishly, unselfishly. But as you know, as probably much better than I do, a lot of times the, the participants are really, the goal is to, for themselves, not necessarily to the general goal. Um, 
because I would say that it's, it's normal is that you see several doctors on the specialties. You know that they have different opinions, and if the, that is put in a program, hopefully that is validated. At least you you get the, the validated knowledge and not necessarily the worst doctor. You, know, and you may not get best doctor. So that, that is my question. When you, in that improvement process, how do you deal with the fact that some of the participants are not really uh, put that goal, system's goal, yeah, so, as their professional goal? So it's actually a really deep question. And there's, I'm going to try and be relatively brief about it. First of all, there's the personal motivation. Most people go into medicine with intrinsic motivation to help people. But they are put in positions where they uh, act as if they're in a guild or in a trade where they need to sell their stuff. So orthopedics is notorious for this. That's why we have so much needless back surgery, for example. Uh, and that guild mentality uh, of enriching, to some extent, yourself, your bread and butter, does creep into medicine because of the nature of our medical system. Uh, for so long, we've been uh, fee for service. So I will make uh, 500, $600,000 uh, as a neurosurgeon or a plastic surgeon, whereas some primary care doctor may, is lucky to earn $100,000. That's a huge um, issue. So that's number one. But number two, when you, you, you alluded to all the specialists, the complexity of seeing everybody, that's a system problem. So people uh, functioning within a broken system tend to start uh, getting burned out, frustrated, intrinsic motivation damps down, uh, and they begin to look out them for themselves because they'd like to get home and see their kids. So the system exacerbates problems uh, of our darker sides as we begin to look out for our own life balance uh, and welfare. So as an example, we did a study. We're trying to find out uh, what the system was for in primary care practices in Massachusetts for referring a patient for a colonoscopy for cancer screening and getting that report back and then to the patient. There were almost no practices that could articulate the system and the processes for doing that, and almost none that could tell us the reliability with which that actually happened. So a patient goes off and gets their colonoscopy, which I'll tell you is a pain in the butt yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and you know barbaric and, and extreme. Uh, and you go through all that, and then your doctor doesn't even know what the result was, and it's not communicated to you. And you, you know, it's just so the system really that's where this all comes in. If we could get the system to be much more efficient, cut out the waste and the redundancy and the idiocy of some of our systems, we might give people a chance to get their intrinsic motivation and get back to the light side. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.